Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service, El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of El Monitor, and today we'll be talking with Dr. Renad Mansour, senior research fellow and project director of the Iraq Initiative at Chatham House. Renaud's research explores the political economy of state building, conflict, and development in Iraq. He also holds or has held appointments at the American University of Iraq, Soleimani, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Cambridge University, where he received his doctorate. He is co-author of Once Upon a Time in Iraq, which is published by BBC Books and Penguin, to accompany the critically acclaimed BBC series. Let me just begin by noting a few points to keep in mind for our conversation with Renad. Iraq's economy has a lot of potential, but it needs help. It shrank by 12% last year in 2020 as a result of low oil prices and the economic impact of COVID-19. It's expected to rebound 2.5% this year but it's still got a ways to go. Iraq is also a major oil producer, which might produce as much as 4 million barrels per day this year, and is already exporting close to 3.5 million barrels per day. Iraq is a young country. 37% of Iraq's estimated 40 million people are under 14 years old, and approximately 57% of Iraq's population is under 24. Now, Renat and I will talk about the trends in Iraq's protest movements, the influence and role of the U.S. and Iran in Iraqi politics and security, the normalization of Iraq's foreign policy, how network analysis informs our understanding of Iraq's popular mobilization units, and the challenges to incremental reform in Iraq. My conversation with Dr. Renad Mansour begins now. Renad, welcome to On the Middle East. Thanks for having me. Let's get right into it. Since 2019, we've been seeing a kind of sequel to the Arab Spring in some countries in the region. I'm thinking of uh, Sudan, Algeria. Lebanon and Iraq, which we're going to be talking about here today. And in these countries, demonstrators, many young, have called for a new social contract with ruling elites. Started in Iraq in October 2019, but obviously had roots earlier. The result of the protests in Iraq was the resignation of Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi and eventually the selection of Mustafa Al Qadami as his successor. So Tell us about this protest movement in Iraq. You you go to Iraq regularly. You talk to people across Iraqi society, culture, and political elites and decision makers. Who are the protesters? What are their demands? What were the sparks and how have they evolved? And is this movement still a force? So I think uh, to start, um, I wouldn't say anymore that it's a single movement, uh, a cohesive movement where you have a single leadership uh, or or a single base. Um, I think, you know, especially since, I mean, it's been a long time since October 2019 until today, um, protests don't last that long as protests. They morph into different things. They transform. I mean, the whole post-protest space is also uh, something to talk about. But what I think has remained and what I think is the best way to try and understand what these protests are all about is not as a political movement as such, but as a society of Iraqis, uh, particularly young Iraqis, but Iraqis more generally, who have been under such traumatic misgovernance for so many years that they've just had enough and they're just fed up. So this is a societal backlash to uh, corruption, to an elite that lives in the green zone for many years that hasn't really been able to provide basic governance. So 
the movement as such, and you don't really see that many protests these days, you do you in certain parts of Nasiriyah, parts of Baghdad, every now and then, the movement as such may have dwindled also, of course, with COVID-19 lockdowns, and also the elite using uh, violence to kill protesters, which, which, is a, which was a thing and continues to be a thing. I think we should really look at them not as, you know, as, as a political movement or as sort of trying to find whether they're impressive or not. And I know a lot of people, leaders think, well, they're not impressive. They don't want to join our government, but it's just society. You know, they, it's not for them to then become the prime minister and president of the country. It's for them to hold to account a government that doesn't provide services, that doesn't, you know, represent a majority of its population. So I think that's who these protesters are. It's all of those who have not been part of that political settlement that we've seen in Iraq since 2003. But they have affected Iraqi politics, haven't they? Because mm -hmm. uh, Adil Abdelmati had to resign. Uh, we have uh, a new prime minister in Mustafa al Qadami, who has been committed to reform and has tried to uh, bridge the gap with the demands of the protesters. Uh, and it seems like their demands and interests in, you know, a, a better life, a better future, good governance, uh, the prospect for jobs has been incorporated into the agenda. And I know it's hard and I know it's slow in Iraq, but it, it seems like the movement has had some impact. Oh, I mean, I do not mean at all to 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 say that uh, the movement is in, is insignificant. I think it's actually the most significant political uh, moment in Iraq's history since two thousand and three, because really these young uh, citizens have been willing to risk their lives uh, and get killed for change. No one in Iraq's government has been willing to do that. Um, and so I think it's a very significant movement and it will continue to be, sorry, as multiple movements. Um, and yes, you're right. They have changed the prime minister, but I think, and, and they have sort of talked about reform and they have pushed an agenda. But I think if you, if you look at it for many years, Iraqi leaders have been talking about reform. I mean, Nouri al-Maliki called his, his coalition the state of law, and that was more than 10 years ago. So the discourse of democratization, the discourse of reform, of freedom, of accountability has been there since 2003. But I think what's different, and this to me is the most important uh, contribution that the protesters have done at a rhetorical level, not at removing the prime minister, is to say that it's the entire system that they're against not a single leader, not a single party. And so they're also against someone like Mustafa al-Kadhami, who comes in as a weak prime minister, who has genuine sympathies for protesters, but at the end of the day, is still willing to play the game of the system, is willing to excuse a lot of corruption and a lot of things as he tries to go after superficial, lower hanging fruit uh, reform programs. And so it's only the protesters really who can see the entire system as one, and who, who really want fundamental change rather than this type of incremental reform that has been tried and tried in the past since 2003 and has not worked for them yet. Renat, uh, help us in, understand this in a bit of uh, historical uh, context. You know, uh, if you look back even to pre-2003 Iraq, uh, you've seen the protest movements were basically with um, the Iraqi Communist Party, uh, and the Islamic side with the, the, the Sadr family, and again, Muqtada Sadr, the inheritor of, of, of that movement, that strand in Iraqi politics is, is still a player today. H how does this current movement fit in, or has there been a complete disconnect since 2003? I mean, the, the, I mean the, these movements, the communists obviously and the Sadrists uh, famously worked together in 2015 and 2016 as, as, as part of the, the protests. Um, I think uh, the Iraqi opposition uh, before 2003, um, they would then come to power after 2003 and they would become part of the system and they would build that system. So, and, and this includes the communists and the Sajrists and all the other parties that were part of the protest and part of opposition prior. So this is more of an organic grassroots movement that has emerged. You've seen, you've seen glimpses of it in 2009 
uh, again in 2011 as, as a year, as you mentioned, the Arab Spring, but in the region, there was also protests in Iraq in 2011 in different parts uh, of, of, of Iraq. And then I would say, especially 2015 and 2016, where you see the Sudrists and, and, and these historical protest movements of the communists and others come out. Uh, but even then, keep in mind, they still ran in elections. They, they won the election actually, but nothing really changed, right? So this to me, the biggest difference again in this protest movement is its complete rejection of the political process as it is. I mean, they're calling themselves revolutionaries, right? They're calling for revolution in a way. Now, it's, it's also important not to overstate uh, how many protesters there are. I mean, of course, uh, we're, 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 the numbers are, are lower, but I think generally anyone who has spent time in Iraq anywhere in Iraq really, from the south to Kurdistan, to the, you know, to, to the west and, 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 and east and, and different uh, provinces, the one thing you would conclude is most people are pretty fed up. And so, although they don't all go and march in the streets, they all think that the government, that the elite that were meant to bring them democracy, including those who were claiming to be protests before 2003 protest movements, have not done that. And in stealth, they've all, instead, sorry, they've all become incredibly wealthy at the expense of their citizens. Are young Iraqis today more or less religious than their parents? And, and what is, how do you see the kind of secular and religious trends in Iraqi society? So I think what happened after 2003 was there was a political system that was set up that was necessarily uh, based on identities, on religion or ethnicity, uh, and and you know it's 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 this ethno sectarian quota system that became the name of politics and the name in which all the corruption, all of the misgovernance would would be sort of would play out, and so as a counter movement, when you have protests emerge. It's, it, it becomes natural for them to say, we're tired of this Islamist government. We're tired of this ethno-sectarian government because that's the government that has been oppressing them for so long. Um, and so they then start, you start to hear ideas of a secular or at least not secular, it's a liberal government. One that where religion, where, you know, and, and, and politics is separated. Um, and so most of the Iraqis, particularly those in, 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 in the protests, want that. But that's not to say that they are not religious. In fact, many of the protesters are religious. I would say that what they, what they subscribe to is this idea that religion should stay outside of politics, which is, you know, I mean, and they, prob and they very much disagree with this sort of Iranian version of, of creating a theocratic state, you know, the wilaya al idea that the, that the religious authority should be the leaders. They very much protest against that. They want liberal, non-religious, you know, non-religious authorities to, to govern their country. Renan, help us understand the politics of the U.S. role in Iraq. It's obviously been vital to the defeat of the Islamic State and then deterring undue Iranian influence. Does the U.S. get any residual credit for overthrowing Saddam Hussein uh, and in what it did to help defeat the Islamic State in 2014 and, and its continued cooperation with Iraqi security forces against terrorist groups? So the U.S. obviously uh, has been the strongest and most important foreign power in Iraq immediately after 2003, at least. Um, that's changed now. But certainly the U.S. Uh, should get credit for helping to design uh, the political system um, for, for working with the bringing, you know, working with the exiled Iraqis to, to try and design that system that would then lead to um, this ethno sectarian quota sharing system known as Mahasasa. Um, and the U.S. has been there. Uh, especially in the earlier years, as, as you know, uh, militarily, but also financially supporting, investing uh, in Iraq. I'd say the challenge, however, and, and one of the reasons why, um, although the U.S. owes, you know, has, has credit for, for going you know, to Iraq by, by some Iraqis, is that it really has made several sort of, there's, there's been many missteps. 
the U.S. hasn't been able to create an Iraq that is accountable to its people uh, or, or support an Iraq that's accountable to its people. Um, the U.S. has helped out in, in, in destroy, you know, territorially supporting the Iraqi government whenever there's a crisis, right? So when ISIS comes up, the U.S. comes in and supports to remove uh, in a military way. Uh, every U.S. president has, in some extent, helped with a mission accomplished. Uh, moment uh, in different ways. But where I think the US role falls short is in supporting the roots, you know, supporting identifying and then helping to fix the roots that lead to uh, groups like ISIS emerging. Those are, those are political, those are socioeconomic roots. And I really think that it is there where the US stop, you know, be, you know stops uh, being a constructive partner uh, in, in that way. Um, and so when I speak to Americans, I think the focus that, that, that I would, would, would put, you know, my emphasis on would be to, to say that, yes, you, 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 there is an amazing, you know, the American military is strong that it could, you know, pursue terrorists everywhere. But how then, what is the role of the U.S. in helping the Iraqi government turn into a more democratic and accountable uh, system? We haven't seen that yet. How widespread and powerful is the opposition to the U.S. troop presence in Iraq, or is this something mostly generated by Iran and its networks there? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely it's, it's especially as Iran and its uh, allies in Iraq begin to lose or have for a long time now been losing their legitimacy amongst their population, amongst the Iraqis, right? Especially the Shia Iraqis, which they sort of thought they had it in the bag for a long time. They're looking for ways to maintain some kind of ideological coherence and anti-Americanism is, is you know, they're hoping could be effective in that way. Uh, to focus on removing US troops to excuse what is their failed governance and their failures in, try in, in, in Iraq. Um, and and it, it's not really working because if you look at um, the, the different times where they've attempted to have anti-American marches, um, Iraqis, you know, especially the protesters, but most Iraqis, even if they are Shia and the Iranians are Shia, are still, you know, not, you know, they, they don't want American occupation anymore, but on their list of priorities, removing U.S. troops is not necessarily the top one, right? They have many more issues in their daily lives, corruption, lack of services, interference from Iran, uh, armed groups killing protesters, armed groups arresting or, or, or jailing or intimidating civil society. I mean, there's so many issues that I think that the anti-American is really the one that some of the groups that are closer to Iran are trying to use to try and distract from. Uh, problems. Let's talk a little more about the role of Iran in Iraq. How complex and deep are the networks of influence across political, security, cultural, religious institutions? I mean, they're, they're, they're entrenched uh, quite deeply. Uh, and that is not to say that Iran is this all-powerful, all-knowing actor. And, and certainly Iran has been exposed this week uh, and, and, you know, to make mistakes. But certainly if you compare Iran's entrenchment into the networks that make up the Iraqi state versus other groups, others or other countries like the US, you see that Iran has been far more successful. From, be from the beginning, even before 2003, uh, people like Abu Mahdi al muhandis and others were active in Iran, ensuring that whatever happened when the US toppled Saddam, that the Iranians would be the first there to, to, to take advantage. And of course, through Qasem Soleimani and other uh, IRGC officials, Iran has been able to to really embed itself in these networks economically, uh, but also politically, as you say, socially through religion. Uh, and, and Iran has allies, political allies, um, not just with Shia Islamist parties, but also with Kurdish parties, also with Sunnis. I mean, it's just, they've, they've really tried to manage to, to get into these networks. Where I would say Iran is beginning to really, and this is probably Iran's biggest uh, insecurity in Iraq, is it's lost the, the street. It's lost that base, that Shia Iraqi base that it just assumed that they, they would, would, would be able to control or they would be able to sort of be on the same side, right? And there's a long time when everyone thought that that was the case, especially with these protesters. But for many years before as well, you have the part of Iraqi society in the South and in Baghdad who are in complete rejection 
and completely and you know bothered and 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 calling for the end to what they see as Iranian occupation to some extent. Um, and so Iran has this huge issue, which is it could have the politics as much as it wants, but it won't be able to really maintain a stable relationship in Iraq if so much of the population is vehemently against it. And I think that would be the bigger issue that Iran will have to deal with as well as kind of the, the, the politics and, and all the others. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, sorry, I kind of went off on a, uh, another side there, but to answer your question, Iran is still more entrenched in the Iraqi system than, than any other external actor. Renad, you recently published a major study on Iraq's power networks and the Popular Mobilization Units, or PMUs. Tell us about your study, its methodology, and what you learned about the role of the PMUs in Iraqi politics and society. So, the, you know, and, and obviously the PMUs have been... Uh, you know, one of the most studied cases of, of, of groups in Iraq, particularly after 2014, as, as an umbrella organization that emerges of all these different paramilitary groups and militias that sort of fights against ISIS as part of the victory over ISIS, but then begins competing in elections. And if you look at the top two winners of the elections, the, the, the first one, which was Muqtada Sadr's group, and the second one, Hadi al-Amri's group, they're both connected to the PMUs, right? And yet there's, there was still this narrative that the PMUs are a non-state actor. And of course, you have political talking heads, particularly in DC, who to discredit the PMUs want to keep them on one side as a non-state actor. But on the ground, the reality is, is, is different. And I think if we're going to go to any kind of reform, we need to first understand exactly what the PMU is to then be able to fix all of the problem. We, can't, we cannot ignore or live in denial of what is happening. And so what I wanted to look at was actually the connectivity of it. So when, a, when, an, you know, when an American diplomat, for example, says that a group like Kitab Hezbollah is a, is a cancer, and the only way to remove, if you could just remove this PMU group, then every, all the good groups will come together and Iraq will be democrat, democratic, right? If you could kill Qasem Soleimani or if you can kill Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, remove these nodes, you, that's the way to improve. But what we've seen time and time again is that doesn't work because of, and, and one of the arguments I make in the study is how connected these groups are to the wider network. And sometimes it becomes problematic to look at the Iraqi state as, as this sort of, the, you know, there are some good guys, there are some bad guys, there are, there are reformists and there are conservatives. Like these kind of distract from a very embedded network which includes the PMUs, but also the rest of the Iraqi state. I started doing this map that was supposed to be just the PMUs. But as soon as I get into one above, I realize actually I'm doing a map of the Iraqi state because even a group like Kitab Hezbollah, they have parliamentarians in, in, in central government and in, in local councils. They have businesses, they even have humanitarian organizations. And so they're deeply entrenched into the Iraqi state network. And so we need to understand how they're entrenched to then understand how reform could even, what it would even look like. And of course, the second point I make is that the PMU as such is not a coherent organization. Uh, but actually the PMU is this sort of series of different types of networks. Some of those networks derive their power primarily from having a strong social base. So their leadership is incoherent and, 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 and fragmented, but they do have a base. And the Sajrist, for example, is an example of that. Those are Iraqi sort of local Iraqi groups, right? With Iraqi citizens as part of them. Other groups, like I mentioned, Kitab Hezbollah, are more like vanguard networks, not parochial like the Sajrist, but vanguard, which means they don't actually have a social base in Iraq. But actually, what they have is this tight-knit leadership, which allows them to spring up in different parts of Iraq or Syria, which allows them to take fighters from here or there and move them there, right? And so in, as you mentioned methodologies, interviewing these fighters, you begin to see that the difference in the structure of these networks actually in, is important. It gives you a lot of clues into the strategy of this group. Will they pursue Iraqi nationalist versus, let's say, Iranian ambition strategies? But it also means that pursuing reform will be different of how to engage, for example, with a parochial group versus how to engage with a vanguard group. So it's, it's, it's more about continuing this study of the PM, PMUs by saying they are not a single monolithic coherent organization, but a sort of a field of different networks and, and understanding how those networks connect, but also how they're structured should be the first step to then pursuing reform rather than just saying, okay, they're non-state actor, let's, let's, let's just attack them, which is kind of what uh, some ad have advocated for in the past.
What then uh, is your assessment of the impact of the U.S. killing of IRGC Quds Force Commander Qasem Soleimani uh, and the top Iraqi PMU leader, um, Jamal Jafar al-Ibrahimi, that's uh, Abu Mati al-Mohandis. Was that a good move? Uh, you had interviewed al-Mohandis. You've looked at these networks. Uh, was that effective in curtailing Iranian influence among the PMUs in Iraq, if we were to be very specific to say that would be the main concern of, of the United States? So if you look at one year later, uh, or, or actually more than a year later since then, and you speak to uh, Iraqis, those even who were against, you know, Abu Mehdi and Mohandas and Qasem Soleimani, those who I've been t talking about who are so over Iranian occupation of their country or interference in the country. And the sort of overwhelming majority would still think that the, and will have told me that it was a dumb move, that a military solution, you know, a strike doesn't, you know, it does, it's not how reform can come about. You can remove a, you know, you could remove a leader but then so many other leaders will, 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 will spring up. And what you've seen since the killing of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis is the emergence of all of these resistance groups, right? Uh, which have made life in Iraq even more dangerous. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, and, and actually we were together once in Baghdad, you, you know, um, Hisham al-Hashimi was, uh, was assassinated. Um, and, and that's, if, I mean, you can look at the reasons why he was assassinated by a group, but the context in which someone like Hisham now became a threat was partly, okay, his, his support of the protesters, but not exactly, but more specifically because he was doing research, but also he was speaking out against uh, the PMUs, right? And whereas when Abu Mehdi was alive, Hisham had a relationship with Abu Mahdi. You could go to Abu Mahdi. You could speak to Qais al Ali or other leaders when there were threats and threats did come up against him when Abu Mahdi was, was, was alive. And when Qais, wasn't, uh, when Qais al Ghazali wasn't hiding, that's gone. So removing that leadership created this kind of chaos where the vanguard groups that I mentioned are able to sort of navigate, uh, but, but that chaos makes it way much more precarious. So the US today, is not in a better position than it was when Qasem Soleimani and Abu Madin were alive. Um, and instead I think is in a far more precarious uh, position. Um, but again, it's this, this, this debate uh, will continue. And I know that there are those who believe that the killing uh, is, is part of a plan to reform Iraq. I just fundamentally haven't seen it pan out yet. On the foreign policy front for Iraq, the government seems committed is making progress in normalizing its regional policies. Uh, there's increasing economic and other types of engagement with Egypt and Jordan on the one hand, and in reconnecting with the, the leadership in the Gulf. And both have been priorities for Iraq. And obviously Iraq wants to stay out of any U.S.-Iran escalation on its territory. This is all a progress, I would think, especially as we go back to, you know, the Saddam Hussein era and the challenges of Iraq uh, after the in, uh, invasion in, in 2003 and the removal of Saddam. Um, Iraq seems to have uh, cultivated a, a positive approach in its regional policies. Would, would you agree with that? And where do you see this is going? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, Iraq is, is is much, you know, much more open to the region, to the international uh, sort of the arena. Um, Iraq is no longer a rogue state as, as such um, yet, some people say, but, you know, Iraq is opened up. Uh, and, you know, I think the biggest challenge for Iraq is how to get out of its status as a playground for a bigger battle between the US and Iran, which particularly we've seen in the last uh, four years under the Trump administration. But yeah, definitely with the government, uh, the key is how do you sort of pluralize international relations? Because for a long time, Iraq was, they had three files. You had the US file, the Iran file, and then the rest of the world file. Um, and, and how do you sort of open that up? And so reaching out to the Gulf particularly is important. 
uh, to, to normalize relations, which we've seen since even Prime Minister Abadi's time, uh, to move towards economic cooperations, uh, but also relations with Turkey become important, especially um, as what happens in Sinjar and parts of northern Ninawa in, in, in post-ISIS areas um, begin to sort of heat up. Uh, and yeah, the, the question for Iraq is how it could regain that status it once had as a regional player. Um, it's a country where its population is growing and I think Iraq will continue to be a powerful sort of country and it has the potential to be a regional actor um, in, in all of this, but it needs to first get over uh, or, or overcome uh, it's it's becoming a playground, really, for 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 bigger uh, forces, which we've seen in the last few years. What are your expectations for the next few months? Iraq is um, early elections scheduled for October. I think uh, those seem to be reasonably on track. I think there is a, a court dis- decision that still has to be made uh, to to confirm uh, the dates at that time. There are pressing economic issues. That's been at the top of the prime minister's agenda. You and I were talking before the podcast started about uh, COVID-19 and uh, the difficult year that Iraq and other countries in the region are are coming out of. Uh, What's your expectation for 2021 in Iraq? It's it's, it's tough. I think it'll be tough. I'm not sure if the elections will actually happen in October or not. Uh, there seems to be a lot of people suggesting that that they won't. Um, but I, until now, the, the date is still set. To me, the bigger question is, will Iraqis vote? I mean, the, the voter turnout um, in, in 2018, most people put around 20%, a bit above, although the government figure uh, was at 44% or so. Um, but if you compare that to 2005, the first elections, we had 80%, Iraqis aren't voting. And you're going to have even more Iraqis because of the growth rate and the demographic shifts who are for the first time entering voter age, but not really interested in voting. Most Iraqis I speak to think that voting is just the process of reinforcing uh, the same system. Uh, and so, the, the, you know, the prime minister is kind of stuck because he genuinely sympathizes with the protesters and at some point was wanting to create a party that could represent or speak to protesters. But the more that he's been in power, the more he's had to play the way, you know, the political system as it is, the more he's had to compromise to political parties to a point where you're beginning to see more and more rejection uh, and, and to the point where he's unable to stop the killing of, of, of protesters, the assassinations, the jailings, he's, he's, uh, he, he's unable to stop and, you know, he's, and also he's unable to go after those that are committing these crimes. So many Iraqis uh, will, will, will question the point of voting and, and, and whether even when you have all of these small political parties that have emerged that claim to represent the, the protests, many of them are not aligned with each other. Many of them are politicized. I think that really at, when the elections come, what we expect is for much of the same, the same cast of characters to, to, to win the seats they do and then to form a government that is a, that is a coalition government like we've always had and to have a prime minister who might on the face of it seem to be a reformist, but who will also be willing to allow the intense, like endemic corruption to continue. And that I think will continue. And so the question becomes, can the Iraqi political system muddle through this way? Can it continue? Because every year you have more Iraqis entering uh, working age and not finding jobs. Uh, The basic services still aren't there. And I think because of that, you will begin to see much more targeted, and I keep stressing this because it's important, you will begin to see much more targeted use of coercion against any Iraqi who speaks out. The jailing of political uh, commentators is beginning. The assassinations of journalists and political commentators is beginning because this is the only way that the government, and I say the word government here because I don't think at this point we should, or that it's helpful to try and split reformists versus conservatives in this way because what we've seen, if you kind of just step back a bit, is an Iraqi elite network all connected to each other and no part of that network protecting or, or at least holding to account mass violations. 
Um, and at some point, we have to look at this as a whole. So when it comes to the economic crisis, when it comes to COVID-19, I think there will be big challenges. And I think many Iraqis will suffer from this. Um, and it will be a very hot summer, as, as, as many summers are. We might see protests. I think we will see protests and, and, and backlash as, as Iraqis lash out against the government. And sadly, if we want to talk about 2021, I think it would be a year more of, of, of violence in Iraq than of hope, uh, sadly. Reform is a kind of long game, though, is it not? I mean, it's uh, um, the prime minister and others in the government who have been uh, trying to take what you have called in articles incremental reform. Uh, that doesn't happen in a year, doesn't happen in two years. You have to kind of move step by step. And do you not see that even that incremental progress uh, could be at risk? uh over over the coming year or so yeah and this is obviously something that uh i've thought about and we've discussed so many times um and and it, it boils down to this question of can the current system as it is be fixed the political system i mean or is it so rotten that something dramatic has to change something drastic will come before we get to another stage right so are we under this linear version in which we are progressing, right? Because we've seen reform in different ways from Abadi's time. Uh, I, you know, Adel Abdelmedi tried to reform things. Now this prime minister is trying to reform things. And so the question we have is, can this prime minister reform or even begin to go after you know, incremental reform, facing the challenges that he faces, COVID-19, the economic crisis, running out of money, right? Complete dependency on oil, whilst also, being willing and and un, you know being willing to to continue to give the handouts to the political parties, right? Where will the stand be? Where will the prime minister make that stand to say, okay, corruption? We're not going to remove corruption overnight, but how do we begin to decrease corruption, right? And is it that you go after sort of the lower hanging fruits, as it, as it were, or you go after sort of the symptoms of corruption or those easy? easy outs, right? The economic stuff, or will you actually address the politics of it? Um, because I would say that Iraq since 2003 has been more cyclical than linear. And in, 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 so incrementalism becomes a bit of a uh, strange thing to imagine, although we have talked about it because we are headed towards different types of conflict. Um, and the demographic speaks to that, right? I mean, Iraq's population will double in, 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 in such a short time. And who's going to give these, these new citizens jobs? Who's going to give them a standard of living? Uh, and, and so there's many questions that this prime minister, as well as prime ministers after him, will have to address. Um, and so, yeah, I go back to that question. I don't think we have an answer yet, but I, I think we are becoming more increasingly skeptical about whether Iraq as it is, is ripe even for incremental reform, um, but who knows in the long term. Renaud, thank you for taking the time today and talking with us about Iraq. It was a pleasure having you here on, on the Middle East. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. It's, it's, it's been great uh, being on here uh, and I look forward to catching up. We will return after this short break. I'm Ben Kaspit, Al Monitor veteran columnist reporting from Israel, one of the world's major news and action suppliers of all times, comparing to its tiny size. I've been covering and analyzing the political, diplomatic, and military arenas in Israel for over 34 years. My best selling biography, The Netanyahu Years, was out two years ago. I covered seven prime ministers, one major war, two intifadas, one prime minister's assassination two and a half peace treaties, four military operations in Gaza, and it's not letting up anytime soon. I am glad to invite you to On Israel, our brand new podcast, where we will discuss major events in Israel and its surroundings, talk to decision makers, leaders and analysts, and try to understand the chaos that comes with the territory of Israel and the Middle East. You will never have a dull moment with us. See you soon here. On Israel, Al Monitor.
That was a fantastic conversation with Renad Mansour, and I would recommend to all of you his recent study on Iraq's power networks. The U.S. and Iraq this week announced that they will resume their strategic dialogue discussions next month in April. And this is, of course, a good sign that the Biden administration recognizes the potential and opportunity of Iraq and its present government. Pope Francis's visit to Iraq last month put on full display the power of Iraq's rich culture and diversity. And despite the many challenges ahead, one thing I've learned from studying and traveling to Iraq is that you can count on the dynamism and resilience of the Iraqi people. Thanks to our production team of Phil Calabro of El Monitor and Beowulf Roshlin of Two Square Media Productions, and to all of you for listening today. We will be back next week, and in the meantime, please sign up for this and our other El Monitor podcast on Israel at your favorite podcast platform. Thank you.